E.D. Acura by Exa. From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. That's en.wikipedia.org. The E.D. Acura by Exa are ancient life forms of the E.D. Acura period. It represents the earliest known complex multicellular organisms. They appeared soon after the Earth thawed from the Cryogenium period's extensive glaciers and largely disappeared soon before the rapid appearance of biodiversity known as the Cambrian Explosion, which saw the first appearance in the fossil record of the basic patterns and body plans that would go on to form the basis of modern animals. Little of the diversity of the Ediacara biota would be incorporated in this new scheme, with a distinct Cambrian biota arising and usurping the organisms that dominated the Ediacara fossil record. The organisms of the Ediacaran period first appeared around 580 million years ago and flourished until the cusp of the Cambrian 542 million years ago, when the characteristic communities of fossils vanished. While rare fossils that may represent survivors have been found as late as the Middle Cambrian 510 to 500 million years ago, the earlier fossil communities disappear from the record at the end of the Ediacaran leaving only controversial fragments of once thriving ecosystems, if anything at all. Multiple hypotheses exist to explain this disappearance, including preservation bias, a changing environment, the advent of predators, and competition from other life forms. Some Ediacaran organisms might have been closely related to groups that would rise to prominence later. For instance, Kimberella shows some similarity to mollusks, and other organisms have been thought to show bilateral symmetry, although this is somewhat controversial. Most um, microscopic fossils are morphologically distinct from later life forms. They resemble discs, um, mud-filled bags, or quilted mattresses. Classification is difficult, and the assignment of some species, even at the level of kingdom, animal, fungus, protist, or something else, is uncertain. One paleontologist has even gained support for a separate kingdom, Vendozoa, now renamed Vendobiomta. Their strange form and apparent disconnectedness from later organisms have led some to consider them a failed experiment in multicellular life, with later multicellular life independently re-evolving from unrelated single-celled organisms. Contents Section 1, History. Section 2, Preservation. Section 3, Morphology. Section 4, Classification and Interpretation. Section 5, Origins. Section 6, Disappearance. Section 7, Assemblages. Section 8, Further Reading. History The first Ediacaran fossils discovered were the disc-shaped Aspidella telenobica in 1868. Their discoverer, A. Murray, a geological surveyor, found them useful aids for correlating the age of rocks around Newfoundland. However, since they lay below the primordial strata, that is the Cambrian strata that were then thought to contain the very first signs of life, it took four years for anybody to dare propose they could be fossil. Alcana Billings' proposal was dismissed by his peers on account of their simple form, and they were instead declared to be gas escape structures, or inorganic concretions, or even tricks played by a malicious god to promote unbelief. No similar structures anywhere else in the world were then known, and the one-sided debate soon fell into obscurity. In 1933, Georg Jorik discovered specimens in Namibia, but the firm belief that life originated in the Cambrian led them to be assigned to the Cambrian period, and no link to Aspidella was made. In 1946, Reg Sprigg noticed jellyfishes in the Ediacara Hills of Australia's Flinders Ranges, but these rocks were believed to be early Cambrian, so while the discovery sparked some interest, little serious attention was garnered. 
It was not until the British discovery of the iconic Charnia in 1957 that the Precambrian was seriously considered as containing life. This frond-shaped fossil was found in England's Charnwood Forest, and due to the detailed geological mapping of the British Geological Survey, there was no doubt that these fossils sat in Precambrian rocks. Paleontologist Martin Glacier finally made the connection between this and the earlier finds, and with a combination of improved dating of existing specimens and an injection of vigour into the search, many more instances were recognised. However, all specimens discovered until 1967 were in coarse-grained sandstone that prevented the preservation of fine details, making interpretation somewhat difficult. S. B. Misra's discovery of fossiliferous ash beds at the mistaken point assemblage in Newfoundland changed all this, as the delicate detail preserved by the fine ash allows the description of features that were previously invisible. Poor communication, combined with a difficulty in correlating globally distinct formations, led to a plethora of different names for the biota. In 1960, the French name Idiacarène after the Idiacaran Hills in southern Australia, which take their name from the Aborigine Idiacara, water is present, was added to the competing terms Sinian and Vendian for terminal Precambrian rocks, names that were also applied to the life forms. Idiacaran and Idiacarian were subsequently applied to the epoch or period of geological time and its corresponding rocks. In March 2004, the International Union of Geological Sciences ended the inconsistency by formally naming the terminal period of the Neoproterozoic after the Australian locality. Preservation All but the smallest collection of the fossil record consists of the robust skeletal matter of decayed horses. Hence, since the Ediacaran biota had soft bodies and no skeletons, their abundant preservation is surprising. The absence of burrowing creatures living in the sediments undoubtedly helped, since after the evolution of these organisms in the Cambrian, soft-bodied impressions were usually disturbed before they could fossilise. Microbial mats Microbial mats are areas of sediment stabilised by the presence of colonies of microbes, which secrete sticky fluids or otherwise bind the sediment particles. They appear to migrate upwards when covered by a thin layer of sediments, but this is an illusion caused by the colony's growth. Individuals do not themselves move. If too thick a layer of sediments is deposited before they can grow or reproduce through it, parts of the colony will die, leaving behind fossils with a characteristically wrinkled elephant skin and tuberculous texture. Some Edecran strata with the texture characteristic of microbial mats contain fossils. And Ediacaran fossils are almost never found in beds that do not contain these microbial mats. Although microbial mats were once widespread, the evolution of grazing organisms in the Cambrian vastly reduced their numbers, and these communities are now limited to inhospitable refugia where predators cannot survive long enough to eat them. Fossilisation The preservation of these fossils is one of their great fascinations to science. As soft-bodied organisms, they would normally not fossilise. Unlike later soft-bodied fossil biota, such as the Burgess shale or the Solnhofen limestone, the Ediacara biota is not found in a restricted environment subject to unusual local conditions. They were a global phenomenon. The processes that were operating must have been systemic and worldwide. There was something very different about the Ediacara period that permitted these delicate creatures to be left behind. It is thought that the fossils were preserved by virtue of rapid covering by ash or sand, trapping them against the mud or microbial mats on which they live. Aspects provide more detail, and can readily be precisely dated to the nearest million years or better by means of radiometric dating. However, it is more common to find Ediacan fossils under sandy beds deposited by storms or high-energy, bottom-scraping ocean currents, known as turbulites. Soft-bodied organisms today almost never fossilise during such events, but the presence of widespread microbial mats probably aided preservation by stabilising their impressions in the sediment below. 
What is preserved? The rate of cementation of the overlying substrate relative to the rate of decomposition of the organism determines whether the top or bottom surface of an organism is preserved. Most disc-shaped fossils decomposed before the overlying sediment was cemented, and the ash or sand slumped in to fill the void, leaving a cast of the underside of the organism. Conversely, quilted fossils tend to decompose after the cementation of the overlying sediment, hence their upper surfaces are preserved. Their more resistant nature is reflected in the fact that in rare occasions, quilted fossils are found within storm beds, the high energy sedimentation not having destroyed them, as it would have for less resistant discs. Furthermore, in some cases, the bacterial precipitation of minerals forms a death mask, creating a mould of the organism. Morphology The Etiac and Biota exhibited a vast range of morphological characteristics. Size ranged from millimetres to metres, complexity from blob-like to intricate, rigidity from sturdy and resistant to jelly soft. Almost all forms of symmetry were present. These organisms differed from earlier fossils by displaying an organised, differentiated multicellular construction and centimetre plus sizes. These disparate morphologies can be broadly grouped into form factor. Embryos and recent discoveries of Precambrian multicellular life have been dominated by reports of embryos, particularly from the Dushan II formation in China. Some finds generated intense media excitement, though some have claimed that they are instead organic structures formed by the precipitation of minerals on the inside of a hole. But the Embryos have been interpreted as the remains of the giant sulfur reducing bacteria akin to Theo margarita, a view which is highly contested yet gradually gaining supporters. Microfossils dating from 632.5 million years ago, just 3 million years after the end of the cryogenian glaciations, may represent embryonic resting stages in the life cycle of the earliest known animals. An alternative proposal is that these structures represent adult stages of the animals of this period. Discs. Um, circular fossils, such as Egyptaria, Cyclomedusa, and Rugoconites, led to the initial identification of Egyptian fossils as Nidaria, which include jellyfish and coral. Further examination has provided alternative interpretations of all disc shaped fossils. Not one is now confidently recognised as a jellyfish. Alternative explanations include hole fasts, protists, and sea anemones. The patterns displayed where two meets have led many apparent individuals to being recognised as microbial colonies, and yet others may represent scratch marks formed as stalked organisms spin around their hole fasts. Useful diagnostic characters are often lacking because only the underside of the organism is preserved by fossilisation. Banks Fossils such as pterodinium, preserved within sediment layers, resemble mud-filled bags. The scientific community is a long way from reaching a consensus on their interpretation. Quilted organisms. The organisms considered in Zylacca's revised definition of the Vendobionta share a quilted appearance and resembled an inflatable mattress. Sometimes these quilts would be torn or ruptured prior to preservation. Such damaged specimens provide valuable clues in the reconstruction process. For example, the three or more petaloid fronds of Swartpuntia germsy can only be recognised in a posthumously damaged specimen. Usually, multiple fronds were hidden to spare the squat of the organism's flat. These organisms appear to form two groups, the fractal rangiomorphs and the simpler oniatomorphs, including such fossils as the iconic Charnia and Swartpuntia, these groups are both the most iconic, uh, include the most iconic of the and Boota, and the most difficult to place within the existing tree of life. Lacking any mouth, gut, reproductive organs, or indeed any ex evidence of internal anatomy at all, their lifestyle was somewhat peculiar by modern standards. The most widely accepted hypothesis holds that they sucked nutrients out of the surrounding seawater by osmosis and non-Ediacaran Ediacarans. 
Some media organisms have more complex details preserved, which has allowed them to be interpreted as possible early forms of a living phyla, excluding them from some definitions of the ETF from biota. The earliest such fossil is the reputed Bilaterian Vernamicula, claimed by some, however, to represent the infilling of an exact or aquatite. Later examples, almost universally accepted as Bilaterians, include the mollusk like Kimberella, Spragina, and the shield shaped Parvancarina, whose affinities are currently debated. The sweeter fossils, known as the small shelly fossils, were represented in the Egyptian most famously by Claudina, a shelly, tube-like fossil that often shows evidence of predatory boring, suggesting that while predation may not have been common in the Ediacaran period, it was at least present. Representatives of modern taxa existed in the Ediacaran, some of which are recognisable today. Sponges, red and green algae, protists and bacteria are all easily recognisable, with some predating the Ediacaran by thousands of millions of years. Possible arthropods have also been described. Trace fossils. The only Ediacaran burrows are horizontal, on or just below the surface. Such burrows have been taken to imply the presence of motile organisms with heads, which would probably have had a bilateral symmetry. This could place them in the bilateral clade of animals. But they could also have been made by simpler organisms feeding as they slowly rolled along the seafloor. Pustiff burrows dating as far back as 1,100 million years ago may have been made by animals which fed on the undersides of microbial mats, which would have shielded them from a chemically unpleasant ocean. However, their uneven width and tapering ends make a biological origin so difficult to defend that even the original proponents no longer believe they are authentic. Burrows observed imply simple behaviour, and the complex, efficient feeding traces common from the start of the Cambrian are absent. Some EDF from fossils, especially discs, have been interpreted tentatively as trace fossils, but this hypothesis has not gained widespread acceptance. As well as burrows, some trace fossils have been found directly associated with an EDF from fossil. Yorgia and Dickinsonia are often found at the end of long pathways of trace fossils matching their shape. These fossils are thought to be associated with cilia reef feeding, but the precise method of formation of these disconnected and overlapping fossils largely remains a mystery. The potential mollusk Kimberella is associated with scrap marks, perhaps formed by a radula. Classification and Interpretation Classification of these Yakuns is difficult, and hence a variety of theories exist as to their placement on the Tree of Life. Nidarians, um, since the most primitive Eumetozoans, that is multicellular animals with tissues, are Nidarians, the first attempt to categorise these fossils designated them as jellyfish and sea plants. However, detailed study of their growth pattern has completely discounted this hypothesis. The Dawn of Animal Life. Martin Glaisner proposed in The Dawn of Animal Life, 1984, that the Ediacarabiota were recognisable crown group members of modern phyla, but were unfamiliar because they had yet to evolve the characteristic features that we use in modern classification. Dolph Zylaka responded by suggesting that the Ediacaran sees animals usurping giant protists as the dominant life form. In 1986, Mark McMenamin claims that Ediacarans did not possess an embryonic stage, and thus could not be animals. He believes that they independently evolved a nervous system of brains, meaning that the path towards intelligent life was embarked upon more than once on this planet. However, this idea has not been widely accepted. New Phylum Zylaka most famously suggested that the Ediacaran organisms represented a unique and extinct grouping of related forms descended from a common ancestor, and created the kingdom of Vendozoa, named after the now obsolete Vendian era. He later excluded fossils identified as metazoans and relaunched the phylum of Vendobionta. 
He described the Van der Brahms as quilted Nidarians, lacking stinging cells. This absence precludes the current Nidarian method of feeding, so Zylak has suggested that the organisms may have survived by symbiosis with photosynthetic or chemoautotrophic organisms. Lichens? Greg Retalak's hypothesis that Ediacaran organisms were lichens has failed to gain widespread acceptance. He argues that the fossils are not as squashed as jellyfish, fossilised in similar situations, and that their relief is closer to petrified wood. He points out that the chitinous walls of lichen colonies would provide a similar resistance to compaction, and claims that the large size of the organisms, which sometimes reach over a metre across, far larger than any of the preserved burrows, also hints against a classification with the animals. And other interpretations. Almost every possible phylum has been used to accommodate the Ediacaran biota at some point in time, from algae to protists such as the foraminifera, to fungi to bacterial or microbial colonies, or even hypothetical intermediates between plants and animals. Origin it took almost 4 billion years from the formation of the Earth for the Ediacaran fossils to first appear, 655 million years ago. Whilst putative fossils are reported from 3,460 million years ago, the first uncontroversial evidence is around 2,700 million years ago, and cells with nuclei certainly existed by 1,200 million years ago. Why did it take so long? for forms of an Ediacaran grade of organisation to appear. It could be that no special explanation is required. The slow process of evolution simply required 4 billion years to accumulate the necessary adaptations. Indeed, there does seem to be a slow increase in the maximum level of complexity seen over this time, with more and more complex forms of life evolving as time progresses, with traces of earlier semi-complex life such as Nimbia found in the 610 million year old Twitia formation, possibly displaying the most complex morphology of the time. The alternative train of thought is that it was simply not advantageous to be large until the appearance of the Ediacarans. The environment favoured the small over the large. Examples of such scenarios today include plankton, whose small size allows them to reproduce rapidly to take advantage of ephemerally abundant nutrients in algal blooms. But for large eyes never to be favourable, the environments would have to be very different indeed. A primary size limiting factor is the amount of atmospheric oxygen. Without a complex circulatory system, low concentrations of oxygen cannot reach the centre of an organism quickly enough to supply its metabolic demand. On the early Earth, reactive elements such as iron and uranium existed in a reduced form. These would react with any free oxygen produced by photosynthesizing organisms. Oxygen would not be able to build up in the atmosphere until all the iron had rusted, producing banded iron formations, and other reactive elements had also been oxidised. Don Camfield detected records of the first significant quantities of atmospheric oxygen just before the first Ediacaran fossils appeared. And the presence of atmospheric oxygen was soon heralded as a possible trigger for the Ediacaran radiation. Oxygen seems to have accumulated in two pulses. The rise of small, sessile organisms seems to correlate with an early oxygenation event, with larger and mobile organisms appearing around the second pulse of oxygenation. The resolution of the fossil record is too low to make this assertion definite, and current research seeks to accurately determine the role that oxygen may have played. Periods of intense cold have also been suggested as a barrier to the evolution of multicellular life. The earliest known em embryos from China's Doshanto formation appear just a million years after the Earth emerged from a global glaciation suggesting that ice cover and cold oceans may have prevented the emergence of multicellular life. Potentially, complex life may have evolved before these glaciations and been wiped out. However, the diversity of life in modern Antarctica has sparked disagreement over whether cold temperatures increase or decrease the rate of evolution. 
In early 2008, a team analysed the range of basic body structures, the disparity of ejaculate autisms from three different fossil beds. Avalon in China, which ranged from 575 to 565 million years ago, the White Sea area in Russia, 560 to 550 million years ago, and Nama in Namibia, 550 to 542 million years ago, immediately before the start of the Cambrian. Now, they found that while the White Sea assemblage had the most species, there was no significant difference in disparity between the three groups. And so they concluded that before the beginning of the Avalon time span, these organisms must have gone through their own evolutionary explosion, which may have been similar to the famous Cambrian explosion. Disappearance The resolution of the fossil record means that the disappearance of the Ediacans remains something of a mystery. There appears to have been a relatively abrupt disappearance at the end of the Ediacan period. Reports of Cambrian Ediacans are not widely accepted. The cause, and indeed the reality of this disappearance, is open to debate. Preservation bias. The sudden vanishing of Ediacaran fossils at the Cambrian boundary could simply be because conditions no longer favour the fossilisation of Ediacaran organisms, which may have continued to thrive, but unpreserved. However, if they were common, more than the occasional specimen might be expected in exceptionally preserved fossil assemblages such as the Burgess Shale in Shenzhen. And thus, such assemblages represent an environment never occupied by the Ediacaran biota, or just unsuitable conditions for their preservation. Predation and grazing. It is suggested that by the early Cambrian, organisms higher in the foods chain caused the microbial mats to largely disappear. If these grazers first appeared as the Ediacaran biota started to do decline, then it may suggest that they destabilised the microbial substrate, leading to the displacement or detachment of the biota, or that the destruction of the mats destabilised the ecosystem, causing extinctions. Alternatively, skeletonised animals could have fed directly on the relatively undefended Ediacaran biota. However, if the interpretation of the Ediacaran age Kimberella as a grazer is correct, then this suggests that the biota already has limited exposure to predation. There is, however, little evidence for any trace fossils in the Ediacaran period, which may speak against the active grazing theory. Further, the onset of the Cambrian period is defined by the appearance of a worldwide trace fossil assemblage quite distinct from the activity barren Ediacaran period. Competition. It is possible that increased competition, due to the evolution of key innovations amongst other groups, perhaps as a response to predation, drove the Ediacaran biota from their niches. However, this argument does not sufficiently explain similar phenomena. For instance, the bivalve mollusks' competitive exclusion of brachiopods was eventually deemed to be a coincidental result of two completely unrelated trends. Or a change in environmental conditions. While it is difficult to infer the effect of changing planetary conditions on organisms, communities and ecosystems, great changes were happening at the end of the Precambrian and the start of the early Cambrian. The breakup of the supercontinents, rising sea levels which created shallow, life-friendly seas, a nutrient crisis, fluctuations in atmospheric composition including oxygen and carbon dioxide levels, and changes in ocean chemistry, which promoted biomineralization, could all have played a part. Assemblages Etiacrim type fossils are recognised globally in 25 localities in a variety of depositional conditions, and are commonly grouped into three main types, named after typical localities. Each assemblage tends to occupy its own region of morphospatial, and after an initial burst of diversification, changes little for the rest of its existence. Avalon type assemblage. The Avalon type assemblage is defined at mistaken point in Newfoundland, Canada, the oldest locality with a large quantity of Ediacaran fossils. 
The assemblage is easily dated because it contains many fine aspects, which are a good source of zircons used in the uranium lead method of radiometric dating. These fine grained aspects also preserve exquisite detail. Constituents of this biota appear to survive through until the extinction of all Ediacans at the base of the Cambrian. The biota comprises deep sea dwelling randiomorphs such as Charlia, all of which share a fractal growth pattern. They were probably preserved in situ, that is, without post mortem transportation, though this point is not universally accepted. The assemblage, while less diverse than the Ediacara or Namatites, resembles Carboniferous suspension feeding communities, which may suggest filter feeding. By most interpretations, the assemblage is found in water that is too deep for photosynthesis. The low diversity may reflect the depth of water, which would restrict speciation opportunities, or it may just be too old for evolution to rip the biota. Virginia is currently divided between these conflicting hypotheses. The Ediacara type assemblage. This assemblage is named after Australia's Ediacara Hills and consists of fossils preserved in areas near the mouths of rivers, prodolteic classes. They are typically found in interbedded sandy and silty layers formed below the normal base of wave related water motion, but in waters shallow enough to be affected by wave motion during storms. Most fossils are preserved as imprints in microbial mass but a few are preserved within sandy units. The Nama type assemblage The Nama assemblage is best represented in Namibia. Three-dimensional preservation is the most common, with organisms preserved in sandy beds containing internal bedding. Demas Grogas Dankin believes that these organisms represent burrowing organisms, while Gina Bon maintains that they were surface dwellers. These beds are sandwiched between units comprising interbedded sandstones, siltstones and shales, with microbial mats where present usually containing fossils. The environment is interpreted as sandbars, formed at the mouth of the delta's distributaries. Significance of assemblages In the White Sea region of Russia, all three assemblage types have been found in close proximity. This and the fauna's considerable temporal overlap makes it unlikely that they represent evolutionary stages or temporally distinct communities. Since they are globally distributed, described on all continents except Antarctica, geographical boundaries do not appear to be a factor. The same fossils were found at all paleo latitudes and in separate sedimentary basins. It is most likely that the three assemblages mark organisms adapted to survival in different environments, and that any apparent patterns in diversity or age are in fact an artifact of the few samples that have been discovered. A timeline demonstrates the paucity of Ediacaran fossil bearing assemblages. An analysis of one of the white sea fossil beds, where the layers cycle from continental seabeds to intertidal to estuarine and back again a few times, found that a specific set of Ediacaran organisms was associated with each environment. As the Ediacara biota represents an early stage in multicellular life's history, it is unsurprising that not all possible modes of life were occupied. It has been estimated that of the 92 potentially possible modes of life, that is, combinations of feeding style, tearing and motility, no more than a dozen are occupied by the end of the Ediacaran. Just four are represented in the Avalon assemblage. The lack of large-scale predation in vertical burrowing are perhaps the most significant factors limiting the ecological diversity. The emergence of these during the early Cambrian allowed the number of lifestyles occupied to rise to 30. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the new free documentation license available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl.html This recording was read by Martin Smith on the 28th of August 2009.